Uh, just as a refresher, the last time we met, we discussed what happened with the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act uh, was a tax on what? Uh, paper. paper. And it affected who? Everyone. everyone. So everyone was angry. In response to the Stamp Act that affected everyone, uh, the colonists organized what? They boycotted British goods. Did it work? Yes, the boycott was very effective because, you know, they amounted to about 25% of all British exports. So were the British forced to repeal the Stamp Act? Okay, so we're good so far. The following, uh, what followed the, the repeal of the Stamp Act was something called the Declaratory Act. So the, the Stamp Act was followed by the Declaratory Act in 1766. And the Declaratory Act is what we like to call a face-saving act. It was a face-saving act. You guys know what it means to save face? Save face. It's a face-saving act. To save face means to, like, protect your pride. So let's say, like, you're, you're walking down the street and you're trying to, like, you know, impress a girl or a boy. And then you accidentally trip. You're like, oh, I meant to do that. You know, like, you're like, oh, no, I was trying to make you laugh. That's why I tripped. So that way you feel less embarrassed and you save face. You try to, you know, maintain your pride, protect yourself. Does that make sense, folks? Well, the reason why the British passed the Declaratory Act is that did they look weak in response to the boycott? It almost made it seem like all the colonists had to do was what? Revolt, boycott, and the British would do whatever they wanted. So the British said, no, no, we can't look weak because of the boycott. So instead, what they did was they said the following. And so they said, the British have the right to pass any taxes. They said the British have the right to pass any taxes without consent from the colonies. The British have the right to pass taxes without the consent of the colonies. The British have the right to pass taxes without the consent of the colonies. So pretty much what they were trying to say was, yeah, we might have repealed the stamp tax, but we repealed it because we wanted to repeal it. Not because the boycott was effective. No, we repealed it because we didn't like it anymore. So maybe you think you did it, but you did it. I repealed the stamp tax because I just was bored of it. Because do they want to give a sense that they're still in control? That's like if you get in a fight with someone and you're like, no, I, I, just want, I wanted to lose. You know, I, I didn't want to win. I, I let you win. And so I just, you know, I, I, I let you punch me in the face. That's what happened. And so that's what the British are trying to do. They're trying to save face by suggesting that, oh no, you didn't succeed in your boycott. I just uh, didn't want to have the Stamp Act anymore. And that way they were saving face by saying we chose to repeal it. But I want to remind you that we can impose taxes anytime we want. And do we have to ask for your mission? Make sense? Okay. That's the Declaratory Act. Next up, Townsend Acts. Now, are the colonists paying the sugar tax? No. Are they paying the stamp tax? No. Are they quartering their troops? No. But do they still have to pay the cost of this war somehow? So the British say, you know what? Can't handle it anymore. They're gonna pay. So we're going to go ahead and pass the Townsend Acts. And the Townsend Acts were a tax on glass, paper, tea, lead, and paint. And the idea was that were they going to tax just a lot of different stuff? And are these things important when you're building a colony? Yeah, glass, paper, tea, lead, paint. These are things that people need. And so they said, if you won't pay a sugar tax, you won't pay a stamp tax, well, we're going to go ahead and just uh, make you pay tax on this stuff. This will be our next attempt. Now again, 
Are they calling us upset about this? Naturally, it's just like the other ones. They're also upset because it restored or it brought back the writs of assistance. So it brought back the writs of assistance. But it also brought back uh, the vice admiralty court. So they were also angry that it brought back writs of assistance and vice admiralty courts. The colonists were pretty angry about that too because were the writs of assistance taking away our rights? The right to a warrant, vice admiralty courts taking away our right to a jury. Colonists clearly upset here. But what really made them angry about the Townsend Acts, and again, obviously, again, no taxation without representation and all that stuff. What made them specifically angry about this one was that these Townsend Acts were to take the money that they raised and pay the governor's salary. Now, who used to pay the governor's salary before this? Who paid the governor's salary before the Townsend Acts? The colonists. The colonists would tax and they would pay the governor. And by paying the governor, would that give them some influence over the governor? Would the governor do what the colonists want? Sure. But now, who pays the governor's salary? It's not the colonists anymore. It's going to be who? Yeah. Sure. It's going to be the British or the king. The king pays the uh, governor's salary. So do the colonists have as much influence anymore? No. So again, it's taking away their power of what? It's taking away their power of the purse. So they're a bit frustrated with this. Well, being frustrated that now the governor's salary is being paid by the British king and taking away the power of the purse. Uh, there's a lot of protests. And uh, one of the letters of protest is written by this man, John Dickinson. And in response to the Townsend Act, John Dickinson writes several letters that we put together called Letters from a Pennsylvania Farmer. As far as I remember, he wrote like 12 letters. He wrote Letters from a Pennsylvania Farmer, again by John Dickinson. And again, these letters outlined his frustrations with the towns and next. What might his frustrations be again? What is he upset about when with the towns and acts? He has the same frustrations as all other colonists. So what might he, he be upset about? Taxes. Taxes, no taxation without representation, taking away self taxation, losing power of the purse. He's upset with all of that. And this letter gets sent around to the other colonists. So the British fear that this is going to cause another boycott and it's going to cause more colonial unrest. There's a fear that uh, this letter is going to inspire the colonists again to boycott and have colonial unrest. So what are the British forced to do to avoid these kinds of problems? Because they want to avoid another boycott, what are they going to do? No. Not going to embarrass them from the colonists. What did they do last time when they, there was a boycott? They're going to be forced to repeal the Townsend Acts. Because, again, did the boycott really affect their economy last time? Yeah. It did. So because of that, they're going to be forced to repeal the Townsend Acts as well for fear of another boycott, for fear of colonial unrest. So yeah. <coughs> well, despite their attempts to avoid colonial unrest uh, in 1767, uh, unrest will still happen anyway. And in 1770, you have the event known as the Boston Massacre. The gist of this that you should know and write down, I'll tell you the other story afterwards. Here's what you have to know, is the Boston Massacre is when about 12 British soldiers 
fired onto a crowd of 400 and killed five. It's when 12 British soldiers fired into a crowd of 400 and killed five. Were the colonists upset about this? Because the colonists realized that uh, the British were now spilling blood. Who was really happy about this? Who was really happy that this event happened? Which colonists? So it was some of the colonists, but which group of colonists? What? The Sons of Liberty were ecstatic that this happened. Why? Why might the Sons of Liberty be somewhat happy that an event like this happened? Because now do they have a reason? Like, look, they spilled blood! It's no longer just about taxes, it's about our lives. And so, of course, what ends up happening is, do they tell the story of the Boston Massacre? Sure. So, here's the thing, though, guys. Here's the actual backstory about what happened. They say that these, if you look at this picture, this is drawn by Paul Revere, by the way. Paul Revere drew this image. Uh, it looks like these British are really angry. They look like they're smiling, and they're like these dastardly British who fired upon these innocent colonists who were just standing around and it was like you know just protesting peacefully and they fired and killed them but that's not what really happened what happened was that these british soldiers led by captain preston he's standing in the back um captain preston and his soldiers were tasked with guarding the custom house okay and they're guarding the custom house uh, when the Sons of Liberty, who are having a drink on in Fenwell Hall in Quincy Market, they get drunk and they decide to harass the British soldiers. So they march down the street and they try to kind of harass and pick fights with the British soldiers. Now the British soldiers are pretty, uh, they're pretty reserved, they're pretty controlled, so they just stand there and take it. And they start harassing them, they start cursing at them, they start throwing snowballs at them, they start messing with them. Eventually that crowd of about 20 uh, Sons of Liberty ends up growing to an unruly crowd of 400 people. Yelling, cursing, throwing snowballs. Eventually they're putting rocks in the snowballs and hitting the soldiers with it. Eventually they're throwing buckets at them. And again, if you are a soldier surrounded by 400 people, drunk, yelling, and throwing things at you, might get a little bit scared. Sure. So the British soldiers raise their weapons and they hold in formation. But Captain Preston, their leader, says, Do not fire. By God's, do not fire. If you fire, they'll kill us all. So don't you fire. Because it's true. If they fired, might the colonists get angry and just murder them all. So there was a fear. So they said, don't fire. Just hold your ground until, you know, our, our, our reserves show up. But until then, just hold your ground. So they did but the entire time the cops are getting angry, they keep throwing things at them, and somewhere down the alley, right behind the British soldiers, you hear someone whispering, but very, whispering, but very loudly, fire, damn you, fire. Fire, damn you, fire. Hoping that the British would fire their guns. And who was that hoping they would fire their guns? The Sons of Liberty, hiding in the alleys, just hoping and praying, almost demanding, commanding, fire, damn you, fire. Eventually, what ends up happening is one of those soldiers, uh, one of the, the colonists, they take those sticks they used to beat rope, and they threw it at the soldiers. It struck one of the young soldiers across the head, and he accidentally fired his gun. Well, having heard the shot, and having heard someone in the back screaming, Fire, damn you, fire! The other soldiers assumed they were given the order to fire, and they all opened fire. After that happened, Captain Preston surprised said, No! Hold your fire! Do not fire! Hold your fire! Stand down, but do not fire! But it was too late. And five people were already dead. And we knew what was going to happen. And so, did the British start this? No. It was an unruly group of people. They feared for their lives. And the Boston Massacre went down in history as the first bloodshed of the American Revolution. Well, folks, 
Samuel Adams. He was the guy who called this the Boston Massacre. But to be fair, was this a massacre? Like five people's not a ma- I mean, it's bad that five people die. That's terrible. But it's not a massacre. That's like one car crashing and everyone dying in the car. You know, massacre on the five freeway, one car. Like, that's sad. And like, yeah, that's, that's terrible. But it's not a massacre. But did John, uh, Samuel Adams want to call it a massacre? Of course, because what he wanted to do was to begin a propaganda war. He wanted to begin that propaganda war against the British in hopes that by spreading this story and this cartoon across the colonies, what might the colonists start doing? They might start rebelling, right? That rebellion he was hoping may not begin with guns, but might begin in their hearts, right? This idea that I can't believe they killed innocent people. He said, uh, and I quote, he claimed that this was a deliberate attack on a peaceful crowd. He said this was a deliberate attack on a peaceful crowd you know, to instill fear in the colonists. It was a deliberate attack on a peaceful crowd. Samuel Adams had a really good way with words, but it was a deliberate attack on a peaceful crowd. And so because of that, Samuel Adams earns the nickname, the Pemmon of the Revolution. And why might he earn that nickname? He yeah, he had such good writing. And what did that writing do? It stirred people to revolution, right? Like, oh my gosh, he's so right. The way he writes makes me angry. I feel that fire burning within. I want to revolt. I don't want to stand for this anymore. So that happened. And they spread this story across the colonies through something called the Committees of Correspondence. The Committees of Correspondence. Let me rewrite that. But the Committees of Correspondence was the Sons of Liberty's communication network. It was like their Facebook. Because like if something happened in Boston, Samuel Adams would post like a Facebook post. It'd be like, Boston massacre happened, five dead, the British suck. And then the other ones from like Georgia and like Atlanta, Virginia would like it and be like, that's terrible. And then they would know. And then Virginia might post like, you know, their own thing. Like, oh, the British are killing five people. And then Massachusetts be like, that's terrible. That's the way they got information about all the anti-British activities. Uh, but the Committees of Correspondence was again, the Sons of Liberty's communication network. Uh, because they couldn't just send things through the mail because what might happen? The British would find it. So they would be like, Quick, Stephanie, get on a horse and take that over to the next town. And be like, okay, and I'll tell the people there. And then they would submit this story across person by person. They'd put up flyers, and that's how they spread information. But yeah, Boston Massacre. If you go to Boston with me, you'll be able to see the site of the Boston Massacre. And we'll make the walk from Fenwell Hall that they made to the site where those people were killed. Then, the Tea Act, three years later. Three years later, the British decide, okay, well, things have cooled down. Could they have passed an act right after the Boston Massacre, by the way? No, because the colonists were angry, right? So they waited about three years for the colonists to cool down a little bit. But did they cool down at that time? They just got angrier and they became more you know, rebellious. But in 1773, they passed the Tea Act. And the Tea Act was a tax on tea, which is obvious, except for the British East India Company. So this was a tax on all tea, except for tea from where? The, the British East India Company. So British tea, there's no tax. But the American tea, is there a tax? Sure. And why might the colonists not be happy about that? Or why might American tea merchants not, not be happy about that? Yeah, they might have to buy their tea. Or if you're a colonist, are you going to buy American tea that's expensive or British tea that's cheap? British. You're going to buy the cheap British tea. Now, luckily, the colonists were like, no, we're not going to do that either. So the colonists says was, they said this created an unfair British monopoly. 
Because you guys know what a monopoly is? What's a monopoly? Like, how do you win the game Monopoly? Money. Not the most. Money. What about money? No, it's not even most land. You win Monopoly when you control everything. That's Monopoly, when you are the only one. Mono, one, mono, Monopoly. Monopoly. Anyway, so the idea is that really because the British had the best price, could the American merchants compete? So did they have a virtual monopoly? They pretty much did. Now the other Americans were selling also, but could they sell at British prices? Because they had that tax. So they said it created an unfair British monopoly. So naturally the colonists boycotted. They boycotted British tea. And were they willing to pay the price for American tea? Yes, even if it was more expensive. They said, we'll pay that tax. We're gonna boycott British tea. But they hated it. Remember that clip that we watched with uh, John Adams and Tom Feathering? And John Hancock's on the boat and he's like, oh, why are we unloading the ship? Because, you know, the British won't unload the ship. And then John Hancock's like, I'm being strangled by Monopoly. He has that British accent. He says he's being strangled by British Monopoly is what's happening. He's angry. Anyway, so the colonists and the Sons of Liberty realize we can't stand for this. We must, you know, fight back. So on the 16th, 1773, We have the Boston Tea Party. On December 16th, 1773, you have the Boston Tea Party where the Sons of Liberty dress up as Native Americans and they decide to dump. They, to climb on, they climb on board a three British ships. These are British ships with British tea. And they dump 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. Boston Harbor. The Sons of Liberty dressed up as Native Americans, boarded three British ships, and dumped 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. Into Boston Harbor. 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. So you know that's about 90,000 pounds of tea. So well, that's a lot of tea to be lifting. It took them over three hours and over a hundred people to successfully complete this. And it cost over a million dollars. They dumped a million dollars worth of tea into Boston Harbor. Today's value. Yes. Three hours and a thousand plus, a hundred plus people. hundred plus people participated dumping all that tea into Boston Harbor. Now, a few things that you guys may want to have answered. Number one, why did they dress up as Native Americans? That's always a good question. It's not like we didn't know that those are just white people dressed up as Native Americans. Like, you're wearing like a headdress, but you're still white. So it's not like, is that a Oh, that's a Steve. Oh, okay, that's, that's the white guy dressed up as a Native American. It's not like we didn't know that they were colonists. But the reason why we did it was symbolic. The British called us savages, so we dressed up as savages. And we dumped that tea. It also wasn't like under the cover of night because there were clearly like tons of people just watching it happen. It wasn't like they secretly did it. No, it was like, it took three hours. So after three hours, if you don't notice that they're dumping tea into the harbor, you're a very bad guard. Uh, and two, there was an entire crowd there just watching it happen, cheering them, I'm like, yay! Yeah, take that British tea and dump it into the ocean. So that's what happened. Well, uh, this was not the only Tea Party, by the way. Uh, this inspired other Tea Parties across the colonies. So there was like a New York Tea Party, there was a Virginia Tea Party, that kind of stuff. So that happened across the other colonies. So that was obviously another sign of rebellion. And how do the British feel about this? Now, do we already owe the money? Yeah. And now they're gonna dump another million dollars into Boston Harbor? Might the British be upset? I would say so. By the way, if you remind me, uh, the week before December 16th, we could have a Boston Tea Party. Yeah. We'll have like a tea party. Yeah. And we'll just like, we're not gonna throw anything into like the, like the <laughs> we're not gonna dump stuff to the pool, but we'll have like a, <laughs> we'll have like a tea party and we'll like, no, drink like, like drink tea. Yeah, we'll drink tea and like have like crumpets from Boston and whatever else. So if you remind me ahead of time, then we'll do that. 
But it's December, so if I forget, I forget. So if you remind me, we'll do that. Yeah, go ahead and then remind me. December 16th? Not yet. The week after, you will. Oh, the week before. What is the I don't know. That's why you have to tell me. <laughs> anyway, so clearly the British are frustrated and angry, so they were with the coercive or intolerable acts, and they are pissed. Before we move on, let's look at this image. Who can tell me what they see? So raise your hand and just tell me what do you see in this image? Yes, sir. I think it's a lady getting abused. This is a woman, and more than just abused, she's being raped. Who is that woman supposed to represent? She's going to represent actually Boston. She's going to represent because Boston's the one in trouble here, right? So she's going to represent Boston. And uh, again, what are they doing to her? They're raping her. Uh, here is a, and who's raping her? Who are these people supposed to be? These are the British, right? So they're looking under her dress, holding her down, forcing that tea down her throat. Here's a British soldier with a sword that reads military law. Uh, here's some of the laws that we'll talk about real quick. Boston Port, the Boston Petition, whatever else. And throughout all of this, there's this woman standing in the back. And what is she doing? She's looking away like she's what? She's disappointed, ashamed. That's, I mean, ultimately folks like Lady Liberty, that could be Columbus, that could be Athena or Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. Um, that could be representing the lust of our, you know, our civilization because the British were doing this. And so it's considered pretty bad what happens next. So here's what coercive acts were. It's actually a combination of three acts. We'll only talk about two. First off was the Boston Port Act. The Boston Port Act. And what the Boston Port Act did was that it shut down the Boston Port until the tea was repaid. They shut down Boston Port or Boston Harbor until the tea was repaid. Pretty much eliminating what? What did they take away from the Bostonians? They're trade and travel, right? You cannot leave and you cannot trade until this T is repaid. That rhymes. You lose your travel and trade until the T is repaid. They spoke rhymes back then. So that takes away their right to free trade. And they also passed something called the Massachusetts Government Act. And the Massachusetts Government Act, what that did, was it closed the general court and all town meetings. It closed the general court and all town meetings. So it closed the general court and all town meetings. Thus taking away what? Their right to self-government. It took away their right to self-government, shut down the general court and all town meetings. And they declared martial law in Boston. What does that mean when you declare martial law in Boston? Who's going to be in charge in Boston now? What is martial law? Anyone know what martial law is? Military rule. So the military is going to control Boston now. They're going to send in soldiers, tanks, ships, and they're going to guard Boston and control it with the military. So they declare martial law in Boston. That's military rule. So like Lepon Day like gets out of hand. They send in the military to like go to all your houses. Uh, they might send in like put like military troops on every street and they tell you what you, time you can go home, go to bed, that kind of stuff. That's martial law. Many countries are in martial law. My father grew up under martial law in the Philippines. So like military rule. Anyway, folks. The colonists saw this as an act of tyranny. They called this an act of tyranny. And they called it a massacre of American liberty.
So is this going to make the colonists very angry? But by the way, folks, did the British have a reason to be angry at the colonists? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, they just cost them a lot of money. So. The massacre of American liberty. So the last act you have to know then, they're all right, the colonists are already pissed. They're angry, their rights have been taken away. Boston has been isolated. And the other colonies, this is just happening to Boston, but are the other colonies worried? Because might the same thing happen to them? They might send the troops, they'll take over New York, they'll take over Atlanta, Charleston. I mean, what's to say that next year they don't send the entire army to take over all the colonies? So they're concerned. The last act is the Quebec Act. And the Quebec Act is more like a slap to the face of the colonists. Like, they're already down. They're already angry, and we just, like, slapped them. That's like, I don't know, like, you stole this guy's job, burned down his house, uh, you destroyed his car, he lost everything, you hacked his bank account, and he's already mad at you, right? He's already lost everything. And then on the, you also tell him, like, oh, and I'm dating your mom. I'm like, oh! And he's like, oh, why did you do that too? You took everything! And my mom! So, like, <laughs> that would be frustrating. So, the Quebec Act was a slap to the face to the colonists. Because what the Quebec Act did was that it gave the, uh, gave the former French, because remember, Quebec or Canada used to be in, controlled by the French, but it's now controlled by the British. It gave the former French religious freedom and self-government. So why might the colonists in uh, the uh, American colonies be upset about this? Because they had that before. And now it's being taken away, right? So this argument is, wait, so you're telling me that you are killing my people. You are taking away my power of the purse. You're taking away my right to taxation. You are eliminating my self-government. You shut down my government. You destroyed my town meetings. You took away my right to free trade. Uh, and you're going to give the French religious freedom and self-government. Is that my understanding? And the British are like, yeah, they're model citizens. You're like, we fought for you. We've been a loyal colony for 150 years. And now, now, we, this one time you take away all of our rights and you give it to them? The people we fought during the French and Indian War? We hate those guys. And yet they're giving the freedoms and the, uh, the rights. So do the... American colonists have something to be angry about. So here's the ultimate question. From the Proclamation Act, actually from the French Indian War all the way through the Quebec Act, do you understand this shift in the relationship between the British and the colonists? Before the colonists were neglected and slowly over that time, what ended up happening to that relationship? What did the British start doing more and more? take more and more and more control. And were the colonists upset about that? Most definitely. But, and did the colonists have a right to be angry? Yeah. Were their rights being taken away? Yeah. Sure. But, did the British also have a right yeah. to be angry? Most definitely. So your final task for today. Choose one or the other, or you can do both. But in your note, I want you to spend the last few minutes. Were the colonists justified in their revolution? Because we will be declaring revolution fairly soon. Do you think they were justified? And if you think so, why? And if you don't think they were justified, why not? Choose a side and defend. If you want to sit on the fence, and you're welcome to argue both. Get to work, folks. Your last task for today.